Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number eight in this Bible study series that we are calling Authentic Faith. It is a study of the book of James, and so you are going to need your Bibles or your Bible apps open to James chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 of James chapter 4 today. There is also a listening guide for this lesson. You should be able to find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down, click on that link. It's a PDF. You can download it, print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, but much more importantly than that, there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through after the lesson as you begin to press these truths into one another's lives. That's where real change begins to happen in our lives when we're, when we're going through that process, so I hope you're doing that as well. Before we jump into the lesson today, let's, let's pray, shall we? Father, we are grateful. Uh, we're grateful that you care enough about us, that you love us so much, that you genuinely want us to understand uh, when our faith has deficiencies, uh, in ways that our faith may not be authentic. Uh, we, we are grateful that you, through the work of your Spirit in us and through your Word and through the powerful combination of those two things, that you will show us what authentic faith looks like You'll help us experience what authentic, authentic faith feels like. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, that you will use times exactly like these, uh, a, a, a Bible study just like this, to help us see those things about ourselves that need to be tweaked or changed or a new direction, and that you'll give us the steps in order to do that. And so that becomes our prayer uh, today, Father. Our prayer is that as we open your word, you will open our hearts. You'll change the way we think about ourselves and you and the world around us. You'll change the way we see things. You'll change the way we understand things. That, that through that renewing of our minds, you will transform our ways and make us more and more into the people you've called us to become. We love you, Father. We love your word and its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Authentic faith. The question that we're asking week after week in this study is, what is authentic faith? How would I know if I have, whether or not I have an authentic faith? Uh, how would I know if there are deficiencies in my faith that need, to be, uh, that need to be addressed? What would that look like? That's what the questions that we're asking week after week after week uh, in this study. Uh, we've been through three chapters of the book of James. It's been a, a really awesome, just an amazing study. Uh, James is just so practical in his counsel. His letter was written originally to Jewish believers, that is, uh, people who had been raised in Judaism and in the community um, format of learning about God, but then they became believers in Jesus. They would have said Jesus is our rabbi. They would have been called him their rabbi. They started following Christ. Uh, but by the same token, even though it was written to that, uh, in that time and in that culture, the things that James has to say about how then should we live our lives in an authentic faith uh, ring so true for us today, and we're, we're seeing week after week as we go through this study that, that it, it's so unbelievably relevant to things that you and I are going through today. Even if we weren't raised in Judaism, we are still finding so much truth here that applies to our lives. Uh, last week we, we had a lesson, actually the last couple of weeks was a lesson on faith and wisdom, faith and teaching, faith in, in our speech and our tongue and how important that is. And that was in chapter 3, but as we move into chapter 4, uh, what we're going to see is that chapter 4 becomes almost a, almost a spiritual bottom line for James. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point that matters the most, uh, because in, in chapter four, he's going to begin talking about uh, faith and the entire process of submitting ourselves to God, walking truly in submission to God. And by that, I mean making uh, God's purposes for our lives, God's desire for our life preeminent, making our purposes, our desires, the things that we want submitted to God's will for our lives. And, and really, I think it, it, it becomes clear in James's writing that from James's perspective, that's kind of the bottom line. That, that really, that, that gets past the fruit that we've been talking about in the first three chapters, all the way down to the root.
it gets down to the root of the issue. Uh, and that is learning this regular discipline, this regular process of repentance, of submitting ourselves to God, of saying, not what I want, God, but give me what you want for me, and trusting that what this all-powerful, all-loving God wants for me really is what's best for me. That's where James is going in chapter 4. And he actually gives us in this lesson, uh, in these first 12 verses, he, he gives us a kind of a roadmap. The first thing, and this, so this is just kind of a preview of what we're about to look at. The first thing he does is he shows us the problem from our perspective. He shows us what we may look around in our lives and notice and realize as red flags that there is this spiritual problem. And the next thing he does is he shows us the problem from God's perspective, the way God thinks about this problem, the way God recognizes the issue. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, he, he gives us the solution, uh, what we can do, the steps that we can take in order to resolve this problem on a regular basis. And then lastly, he actually gives us a, a sample symptom, one sample symptom of a problem. And then next week, he's gonna show us yet another sample symptom of this problem. Uh, but he begins this lesson on submission by looking at the problem from our perspective and uh, helping us to see when you see these things going on in your life, Blake, that's a red flag that there is this spiritual problem. You can see it from, with your own eyes. You can experience it. So let's just jump into James chapter 4 and see where this takes us, and we'll, we'll see how James unpacks this lesson. Now, beginning in verse 1, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. All right, let's stop here and, and unpack this. The, the outcome... Uh, that he's looking at here is kind of the our perspective on this problem the fights and quarrels among you what causes all of this brokenness in your relationships what causes all of this tension and anxiety in your life and what he what he identifies is it's because of your you're letting your own desires dictate your life you're living your life in accordance with what you want you're living your life in accordance with, with the passions and desires that you want for yourself. That's become the highest value. And, and he goes on to say, so you murder for it. So you murder for it. Now that seems like an awfully harsh word. Wait a minute, James. I, you're just telling me because I want these things that may not be what God wants from me that, that you're accusing me of murder? Uh, fight, what, there's a big difference, isn't there, between fights and quarrels on the one hand and murder on the other hand. And James would say, yeah, not as big a difference as you think. And by the way, I think his brother Jesus would have said not as big a difference as you think as well. Remember Jesus in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, verse 21, this is how he says it. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus does the same thing as his brother James does by saying these arguments and fights and quarrels among you, they rise to the level of murder. And why is that? Why is that? Well, both of them are looking back to the root of the anger. They're looking back to the, the feelings that are going on inside of us when we're feeling this anger towards a brother. The feeling or the notion, and this is, this is really the root of the problem, the feeling or the notion that the world would be better off if that person were not here, or our community would be better off if we didn't have those people, or our church would be better off without that person. And what James is saying is when you have those kinds of thoughts, when you say our country would be a better country if we just didn't have those people, you have just spiritually committed murder. That's what James is saying. That's what Jesus said as well. James and Jesus both attribute a lot of our strife, a lot of the strife that we feel in our life, a lot of the fights and quarrels among us, they attribute it 
to this inward focus, this inward focus of I just want what I want. I just want what what I want. And, and if you're going to get in my way, then I don't need you. I don't need you in my life. I don't need you in my church. I don't need you in my community. I don't need you in my country. I would be better off if you were not here. And, and so that strife really gets right down to making my life all about what I want, as opposed to caring first and foremost about what others might want. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank on your listening guide. When I make my life or my work or my church or my community all about what I want rather than making it about what God wants for myself and for others, it will inevitably lead to brokenness and strife. So the first approach that James takes in addressing the the root of our problem is, you know you've got this problem from your own perspective, look around. If, if, if as you look around, if what your life is filled with is strife and brokenness and broken relationships and fights and quarrels and anger, then that's how you know there's something terribly wrong. That's how you know there's a deficiency in your faith. Your faith is not authentic in that regard. Uh, the problem from God's perspective looks a little bit different, and he goes on next to describe the problem from God's perspective, beginning in verse 4. Look what he says. This is from God's perspective. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so from God's perspective, from God's perspective, our problem that we're dealing with is an improper attachment to the world. We've attached ourselves um, way, way, way too much to the world and to the world's way of thinking and to the world's way of doing things, to the world's way of talking about things, to the world's way of being. We have, we've have, we have been infested. We've been, been infested by the world too much. That's from God's perspective, with the world's cravings and the world's desires. Now, interestingly, I love this. I actually love this illustration that he uses. He uses a metaphor of marriage, which was a familiar metaphor for the Jewish people and should be a familiar metaphor to those of us who are Christ followers as well. The church being the bride of Christ, the people of Israel were often compared to in, with prophets, um, were often compared to uh, having been married to God and, and, and they were in a marriage relationship with, with God. And so this is a very common metaphor. And what, he, what, what he's saying here, from God's perspective, in your marriage to God, you are cheating on him with another lover, with the world. You're flirting is the way Eugene Peterson puts it in the, par- in, uh, the message paraphrase. And I love that, that term, that concept. You are literally flirting with another lover right in front of God when you attach yourself to the ways of the world. An adulterer, when we place our world, our worldly desires, uh, when we place our worldly desires above God's desires for us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, this is the way Jesus said it. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Uh, that's Jesus' way of saying, you've got to choose which is going to be your master, the, the ways of God or the ways of the world. Uh, the, uh, the Apostle John also addressed this in 1 John chapter 2. Actually, uh, actually the Apostle John uh, addressed this in several different places, not only in his gospel, but in his letters. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, though, that, listen to what John says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Uh, 
I, I, I love, I love that, this, 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 that everyone in Scripture is talking about this struggle that's going on inside us, but we really do have to come back and circle back to verse 5 and address one issue that may have come up in your own study, and I want to just at least have addressed it. Uh, the trouble with verse 5 is that it looks like in many English translations, James is quoting Scripture, quoting from the Torah quoting from what we would call the Old Testament scripture. The problem is it's not actually a quote. It is a clear reference to a scriptural concept, but it is not actually a specific quote of any particular scripture. It is a very, very clear reference to an idea, to a concept that comes from the Old Testament, that comes from the Torah. But, but the question is, and this is what's so interesting about verse 5, which concept is it a reference to? And what I mean by that is, uh, apparently, and I'm no, uh, I'm no scholar of any of the original languages, either the Hebrew or the Greek, uh, but apparently verse 5 in the original language is a really difficult verse to translate. There are probably many reasons for that, but one, among the questions that are not clear in the translation in the original language is, which spirit, when it says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, which spirit is that referring to? Uh, the Amplified, when you look, at, when you look this uh, verse up in the Amplified version, which I love because it, it, it really does uh, give a fuller explanation when there are options like this. The Amplified actually shows both options. One way to translate verse 5 is, it's the human spirit that he has made to dwell in us with all of its lusts and its envy. So one way to translate verse 5 is, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, you have a human spirit in you who is all about jealousy and envy. Or another way to translate it is the way the ESV translated it, the way I read it, which is uh, the Spirit, whom he, the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of God, whom He has caused to dwell in you and jealously desires us. I don't know which is the better way to translate that. Even among our English translations, if you look at a variety of English translations, you'll see it both ways. You'll see it described both ways. And I don't know which is the right way to do it, uh, so what can we pull away irrespective of which way we translate that? What can we take? Well, what we can take away from this is either way, whether this spirit that it's addressing is the human worldly spirit, the flesh, or whether it is God's spirit, the spirit of God living in us, whether it's the human spirit who is causing us to envy and be jealous about all the wrong things, or whether it's God's spirit who is jealous for us. He is a jealous God. Either way, what it's, what it's showing to us is there is this clear scriptural concept, James would say. There is this clear script, scriptural concept that we have both struggling within us that we have this battle, this inward battle going on within us between our own fleshly desires and what God wants for us. This is James's double-minded person that he's made reference to in all of the chapters so far. Verse, chapters 1, 2, and 3, there are all these references from time to time by James about don't be so double-minded. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of, of an old... Um, um, uh, American Indian, uh, uh, Amer Native American uh, t tale that is that is they they describe this same kind of a battle of e of good and evil going on within us as uh, as if uh, the way I've heard it described is we each have two dogs living in, in us that are constantly fighting one another a good dog and a bad dog and they would say the dog that in the end ends up winning is the dog you choose to feed the dog you choose to nurture. All right, well, that's a crude, uh, close to an eternal truth kind of a way of thinking about it, but there really actually is this eternal truth out of Scripture that James is wanting us to be aware of, and that is there is this spiritual battle constantly going on within us between our human fleshly brokenness and that spirit, the spirit of, of man, and the spirit of God as a believer, the spirit of God living in me. And, and 
I, I should be making choices in my life that are, quote, feeding the correct spirit is the bottom line. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next blank on your listening guide. As Christ followers, we each have conflicting spirits within us, God's spirit and the world's or human spirit. At any given moment, we ground our way of being in one or the other of them. In, in any given moment, Paul describes this as walking in the light. We should walk in the light as he is in the light. Uh, at any given moment, our way of being is either being grounded in the work of the Spirit in our lives, or it's being grounded in the work of the world, the work of the flesh in our lives. And the whole point of our time in this world, short of heaven, is to be transformed slowly, this slow, gradual sanctification process of making more and more choices, learning to make more and more choices in favor of the Spirit of God rather than the Spirit of this world. And so what he does next is he gets into the solution. What James does next is he says, here's how we fix this. Here is the solution to this. Verse 7, he says, and this is, again, typical James, so very, very practical. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Well, this little section that we've just read, verses 7 through 10, is jam-packed, is loaded with memory verses, with verses that, because this is just a bullet point after bullet point practical guide to what spiritual disciplines should look like in our lives. I want you to just look, note all the verbs. Let's just look at the action words. Look at the verbs in this passage. Submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, purify, humble. When you look at those words, those are our positive steps. We've said this all along. When we ask the question week after week in this study, how would I know if my faith is not authentic? And when I find that I have a deficiency in my faith, what are my steps forward in order to address that? Those are the steps forward. That's what all of this lesson has pointed to. This one, I mean, all of this unit, this Bible study unit, the whole book of James comes to this climax in, ver in chapter 4 when James says, here's what you need to do. You need to submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, purify, humble yourselves before the Lord. These are the action words that we're after. These are our action steps that need to be taken. He's saying that that's what an authentic faith looks like. There is this regular discipline in an authentic faith of doing these very things. Our heart in an authentic faith, our heart is inclined toward submission to God. That is the submit or resist or draw near. Our heart is inclined towards that in an authentic faith. In an authentic faith, our heart is inclined toward a regular repentance before the Lord, a purify, mourn and weep. You've got to get down on your knees before the Lord in order to be able to stand before this world. Uh, and, and so there is this regular routine of repentance. Our heart is inclined in an authentic faith toward humility, towards humbling ourselves before the Lord, towards recognizing, I don't even deserve to be here, Father. I, I certainly don't know what's best for me. I've tried my way. It results in fights and quarrels and strife and anxiety and brokenness. I just want your way. It is Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. This is what I want, God, but, but give me what you want, mostly. First and foremost, that's what I want, that kind of humbling ourselves before the Lord. These characteristics are all a matter of discipline initially. In other words, we put the spiritual disciplines in place to discipline ourselves to ask for these things and to seek these things. And over time, the sanctification process literally begins to change the desires of our heart. And that's what we're after. There is a certain trajectory, a certain direction that we need to continue to be moving ourselves in in order to get to that point. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement on your listening guide. Authentic faith does not mean perfection. 
but it does imply a certain trajectory or direction in favor of humbling ourselves before the Lord, regular repentance, and submitting ourselves to His will for us individually and for the world around us. That's the solution that James points to. But then he comes back, all circles all the way back around to where he started this lesson about these fights and quarrels among you as a red flag. Should be a red flag to you that something's not right. These fights and quarrels among you, he comes all the way back to that, and he gives us a common sample of the kind of brokenness that results from our worldliness, from our trying to do things our own ways. Beginning in verse 11, here's what he says. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, you've probably heard references to this passage before, who are you to judge? You should not judge. Uh, what does that mean and what is James talking about? Let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, let's start with what James is definitely not talking about. James is not saying here that Christian accountability is wrong. He's not saying here that, that there is no role on our part uh, or on your part to confront me when I am clearly making decisions in my life that are opposed to what God wants for me, that are opposed to the black and white scripture. It's just clearly opposed to Scripture. That, that, that accountability that we have to one another is all over Scripture. Scripture speaks to that in so many different ways. Matthew chapter 18, if one of you, is, uh, if a brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, if, uh, if, if one of you is caught in a sin, you who are righteous should go to him and restore him gently. Uh, there are references in, in the, the Paul's letter to Timothy. There are references throughout Paul's writing. There are all kinds of references from Jesus and from Paul and throughout the New Testament about confronting a brother uh, and th who is clearly making deci sinful decisions. So what is, what is James talking about then if he's not talking about that? I think the clearest example I think the clearest example of what James is talking about here is what happened to his own brother, to Jesus from the Pharisees. The Pharisees' judgment of Jesus uh, felt, no question, felt to James to be completely unfair and wrong in so many different ways. And now he's watching his own Jewish brethren do the same thing to one another. What exactly is it that they were doing? What did the Pharisees do to Jesus? They were not confronting Jesus about a violation of God's law. They were confronting Jesus about a violation of their very limited interpretation of God's law. And for 400 years before we got into the Gospels, the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Pharisees had had, had, had the opportunity to try to further explain and further develop God's law and clarify God's law and maybe add a little bit here or there because God's law maybe wasn't as clear as it could have been here, so let us clarify this and add to this. And, and they had all of these various interpretations of God's law that, were, that became expectations for how people should live. And when Jesus didn't live up to their interpretations of God's law, they began to persecute him. They began to confront him. That's exactly what James is talking about in terms of judging one another. Um, he, he's, he, he's, the, the same application would hold true for us today. When, when we tear people down, not because they are not living up to Scripture, but because they're not living up to our expectations based on our very limited interpretations of Scripture, when we're tearing them down for that, that is what James calls judging, and we shouldn't be doing that. Because what he's saying to us there is, he's saying, you're making new laws. You're adding to the gospel. You're adding to, the, to God's laws. Your attempt to explain or clarify God's law because you don't think God has done it quite good enough, your attempt to explain or clarify it is creating new laws and new expectations, and then you're using those to hit over the head, over people's head and tear them down 
for not meeting your interpretations, and that's just not right. You're putting your place yourself in God's place as the giver of the laws. This type of judging, it's an example of our own worldly wisdom running amok is what it is. It is our own worldly wisdom. We think we know what's right. We think we know better than the actual words of Scripture, and we create our own expectations as a result of that. The more we immerse ourselves, however, in Scripture itself, the more we are attuned to when that's happening in our lives. The more time I spend in the real thing, in Scripture itself, the more time I spend in here, the easier it is for me to recognize when I have created an expectation that does not come from Scripture. And that's, that's really what, what, what James is saying here is it, is it is so arrogant, so wrong of us on our part when we create our own expectations because we're interpreting the law of God a certain way in order to in order to to scratch our itch in order to meet our needs and then we're holding other people to that and tearing them down for not meeting those expectations if you have a listening guide let's fill in the fourth statement on your listening guide it is the height of christian arrogance when we tear people down not because of their violation of god's laws per se but because of their violations of our very narrow interpretations of god's laws that is what the pharisees did to Jesus. And so what has James said to us here about submitting ourselves to God uh, in, this, in this climax chapter of this book, in this climax chapter of this is the root of the problem? What has he said to us? Well, number one, when I make my life all about what I want, it will inevitably end badly. Number two, uh, there are two spirits at work within us, within me. There is a worldly spirit, the flesh, and there is God's spirit. And, and there's this constant battle between them. And, and I want to be disciplining in my life to grow God's spirit in me. Number three, the solution is to humble ourselves before God and to practice regular repentance before the Lord. And then fourthly, don't add to Scripture or add expectations and then tear people down who don't live up to those expect expectations. That's just a, 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 a symptom of this deeper rooted inauthentic faith that James is talking about. And that's chapter four, verses one through 12. I'm loving these lessons. I hope you are as well. Hope you have, have a blessed week this week. I will be right here uh, with you next week to pick up right where we've left off. We're gonna pick up the second illustration of what it looks like uh, when, when, we, when we fight and quarrel with one another. We're gonna pick that up at the end of chapter four next week. In the meantime, I love you guys. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week.